Well, ladies and gentlemen, finally, welcome to this, the 13th Philip Roof Memorial Lecture. My name is David Alteras, and I am chair of the legal group of the British Friends of Neve Shalom Wahat Al Salam, the Oasis of Peace. Philip Roof, in whose memory this lecture is given, and indeed in whose memory all the previous lectures were given, was the first chair of that group. His daytime job was as a criminal barrister, but he was also a passionate, and I mean passionate, supporter of the village, a tireless advocate on its behalf, and also a passionate believer in its underlying philosophy. It was he who introduced me to Neve Shalom, and on his untimely death in 2009, 13 years ago, I became chair in his place. He is still sorely missed, I have to say. This is the 13th lecture given in his memory. It is a matter of enormous pride that this modestly sized charity has been able to attract over the past years such a dazzling array of speakers from um, David Aronovich, Baroness Julia Neuberger, Simon Sharma, Bishop Rose Hudson Wilkin, and Professor Philippe Sands, King's Counsel, as we must now call him. Our present speaker continues that tradition, without doubt. The large number of people who have braved this winter evening and assembled in the hall uh, is surely a reflection of the high regard in which she's held. So before I go any further, there are one or two matters, before I introduce her, there are one or two uh, matters that I want to touch upon. First, housekeeping. In case of fire, the staff will supervise any evacuation from the hall. Please make your way to the nearest exit and out through the front door onto the street. For those who haven't yet found them, the lavatories are on the first landing. And uh, will you also please turn off your telephones, your mobile telephones? I, I remember a very embarrassing incident when I was in the Court of Appeal and just addressing um, the then um, uh, Master of the Rolls when my phone suddenly went off. And it was difficult to know what to say. I couldn't really say to the court, well, it's, it's for one of you, actually. <laughs> um, next, uh, again, as in previous years, I must pay fulsome tribute to our generous sponsors, uh, Mishkon de Rea solicitors. Our sincere thanks to them. And so finally to the village itself, which lies some distance outside Jerusalem and which was established more than 40 years ago by Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs, having the vision of living together in peace and equality. And although the village has grown considerably over the years, its underlying philosophy, that is to say, peaceful coexistence, so important in the context of the Middle East, you may think, peaceful coexistence remains the same. And I am happy to be able to tell you that this evening we are joined by two representatives from the village, Ruth and Hezi Schutzer. Um, you're welcome. The village boasts a primary school attended by about 300 Jewish and Palestinian children in roughly equal numbers, drawn from the village itself and from the surrounding area. This is important. All the teaching is bilingual. It is in Hebrew and in Arabic. It, you may think, provides a unique opportunity for the children to learn together, to play together, and to form friendships, allowing them to view each other as human beings, not as a representative of the other. 
There's also a school of peace in the village where Jewish and Palestinian participants of all ages formally meet to explore their respective national, cultural, and ethnic identities with the help of trained Arab and Israeli and Jewish facilitators. The youth workshop is part of that program where annually some 60 odd high school students, equal numbers from each community, meet and spend three days in the village talking to each other in structured sessions, but also outside structured sessions informally amongst themselves during those three days. For many, that will be the first time that they have met anybody from the other side. And I have spoken to a number of representatives of the village, and that is not an exaggeration. Tens of thousands of Jews and Palestinians have passed through these workshops and courses and taken advantage of them. So far, I've spoken in positive terms, but inevitably, there have been some strains. Fighting in Gaza tests internal harmony. Extremists on both sides of the divide oppose the very idea of the village. There have been arson attacks on the buildings in the village, including the library. Anti-Arab slogans have been daubed on the walls of the primary school. Government support for the school is minimal, so that it now depends largely upon sponsorship from international charities such as ours. The recent election in Israel, I have to say, these are my own words, the recent election in Israel has brought to power a reactionary government, including, and I again emphasize, this is my own view, some frankly racist representatives. Yeah. And it has caused some dismay amongst the village and its supporters in Israel and abroad. But now I must ask the children to speak for themselves. Could we have the video, please? The school is for Arab and Jewish people, students. Um, I love that we are both of us in this school. I love Jews and Arabs. I, I love both of them. Um, first, uh, Palestine and Israel are enemies. Like they, they don't like each other and the people don't like each other. So this school made, made they made the school because they wanted uh, uh, the Jews and Arabs to be together. We have our difficulties. Um, but on the other side, it's very normal, you know? When I tell people like, it's half Jewish, half Arabic, they're like, oh, it's like you have a lot of conflicts and stuff. And I was like, no, actually we don't. It's actually like a normal class. The most important thing we want to show them that we want to show them that, that we are the same. There's no reason, and everybody plays together. Everybody 
has friends, no one is alone, and that's what this school is about. <laughs> בהצלחה לכולנו, אנחנו סומכים עליכם. אוקיי? אנחנו מנדפת את העולה, צריכים להזין, עכשיו עלינו אישים מוהם מקטיר. הכי מעניין זה ללמוד את שלוש השפות ביחד, אנגלית, עברית וערבית. כיף זה שבדרך כלל עושים פעילויות לכל בית הספר, אז, כולה, אז כל אחד לומד את, ה, את, את איך שהאחר אה, עושה דברים. זה <אז> מאוד מיוחד לדעתי, וזה גם השם תואם את זה. נווה שלום. I'm sorry there was some trouble with the lighting, but I hope everybody managed to see the film, which is, I think, uh, quite an inspiring film. Now to our speaker. Uh, could we have lights, please? The house lights take a moment to warm up. All right, I'll continue to warm to talk. Uh, Baroness Brenda Hale of Richmond, the Spider Woman, as she is known to so many members of the public, she must be absolutely sick and tired of being called that. <laughs> Um, needs little introduction. For lawyers, she's always been a formidable presence. First as a professor of law at Manchester University, then as a ridiculously young member of the Law Commission, tasked with reviewing the law and recommending reform, then as a Lady Justice of the Court of Appeal, and then finally as a Justice of the Supreme Court, eventually ending up as its president. When I wrote the introduction to this lecture, as I did, that her judgments and opinions are written in a style that renders them easily accessible, highly persuasive, and always sympathetic, I wrote that from my own experience, having often used ju her judgments and her opinions in the course of, not always successful, but in the course of legal argument. Personally, I had the great pleasure of getting to know Brenda when I was a pupil barrister in 1969. Um, and we became, I hope she will agree with this, we became friends. So now, ladies and gentlemen, may I give you uh, Baroness Brenda Hale of Richmond. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, David. It is a great honor and a great pleasure to be with you all today. I have a huge fondness and respect for the people of Israel. I led the UK delegation in our triennial legal exchanges with the Supreme Court of Israel for many years. But I also have great sadness that the second half of the Balfour Declaration, respect for the rights of Palestinian people, has not been realized. So I hugely respect your efforts to promote peace and good relations between all of its peoples. But I was asked to talk about myself, which is a very risky thing to ask somebody of my age to do, because <laughs> we never know when to stop. Um, so I thought I'd tell you a bit about my journey into and through the law a little about my final destination, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, and a little about why we need diversity and inclusion in the judiciary at all levels, uh, but particularly at the top. And I hope there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. I grew up in a small village in North Yorkshire. My father was headmaster of a small independent grammar school uh, for boarders and day boys. 
Uh, it had been requisitioned by the RAF during the war, but started up again afterwards uh, with three teachers and a handful of boys. Uh, and my mother was a trained teacher, but she'd been obliged to give up teaching uh, when she married my father in 1936. There was a marriage bar in the teaching profession then, uh, so she ran the boarding house and latterly did some teaching at the school. Uh, and they built it up from those small beginnings to be quite a thriving establishment. They were both very involved uh, with the church. My father was a lay reader and my mother ran the local uh, mother's union. Uh, I was the middle of three sisters. Uh, my younger sister and I went to local state schools. However, everything changed uh, when my father died suddenly of a heart attack when I was 13 and my younger sister was 12. My mother was devastated, but she hid it well from us. She provided a wonderful role model by dusting off her teaching qualifications and becoming the head teacher of the local primary school, which meant that we could stay uh, at the local high school in the same village with the same friends. Um, whenever I'm asked for my female role models, which I frequently am, my mother is undoubtedly one of them. We learned a lot from her. But village life was very different in those days. Uh, the village community consisted of the local farmers, local farm workers, a local tradesmen, and other workers on nearby Catrick Garrison. There were very few professionals, just the vicar, the doctor, and the teachers. So we were incomers and outsiders. Uh, we were also unusual in that it was taken for granted that all three of the Hale sisters would go to university if we could. <coughs> And this was at a time when only two and a half percent of the young women in the relevant age group went to university. Five percent of the young men did. There were also twice as many grammar school places for boys in Richmond, our local town, as there were for girls. So built in quotas all round. I sometimes wonder whether our parents' expectations uh, would have been the same had one of us been a boy. Maybe they'd have put more in ambition into the boy. I think not. They were a very egalitarian couple. It's another thing I learned from them. And I was lucky enough to go to Cambridge. I was the first from the school to do so, and I was the first to study law. And I'm fond of saying that I chose to study law because my headmistress didn't think I was clever enough to read history. <laughs> in those days, people who weren't clever enough to read history uh, read law. Now, of course, it's the other way around. But actually what she said was that she didn't think I was a natural historian. And I'd already developed a fascination for British constitutional history. So I suggested law. I'm not sure I thought that I would ever be making constitutional history myself when I decided to do that. Uh, another reason, of course, was that I didn't want to be a school teacher like my parents. And I, greatly to my headmistress's credit, because she wasn't very imaginative about what her girls should do, she didn't say nonsense, girls don't do law, or they only do it if their fathers are solicitors, which was largely true in those days. So she encouraged me as much as she could. And I had a great time in Cambridge. Another built-in quota there. There were 21 colleges for men and three for women. Um, which actually was deeply unfair to the women, uh, but great if you wanted a good social life, <laughs> which I did. Uh, and while I was in Cambridge, I toyed with becoming a barrister, uh, thought about becoming a solicitor in Yorkshire or in London, actually achieved articles with uh, what's now called a Magic Circle London firm, but I actually settled for teaching law at Manchester University. And I chose to go to Manchester because they wanted me to qualify and practice as a barrister alongside my teaching. And in those days, you could qualify by taking a self-tuition correspondence course. It cost me 20 pounds from the College of Law. It now costs nearer 20,000 pounds to do, do the bar course. But it meant I could practice part-time at the Manchester bar while teaching my students. There was a, a report in the newspapers that I was a barmaid. I never was a barmaid. 
This was some lazy journalist who read in some bio of mine that I practiced at the Manchester Bar. <laughs> Didn't realize, no doubt, that there were a thriving uh, collection of barristers in Manchester, as David knows. Um, and that is how I met David, because he did pupillage in the same set of chambers as my first husband. And I can remember our playing Desert Island Discs together uh, at, at uh, dinner parties. Um, it never occurred to me that I would actually get invited to do Desert Island Discs sometime in the future. There you go. Um, so I practiced for a while uh, doing both. Uh, but after a few years, I had to choose. The teaching got in the way of doing the longer and more interesting cases and the cases got in the way of doing the research and writing that all university teachers are expected to do. And I chose university teaching. And that was partly because my husband was also at the Manchester Bar. We narrowly avoided being on opposite sides of the same case rather too often. We also thought it'd be quite a good idea if one of us had a steady salary. University teachers are not paid a lot, but they are paid. Uh, and barristers, uh, that's a questionable thing, especially when you're starting out. Uh, we also thought it would be uh, easier to have children if I was a university teacher uh, rather than at the bar. And so that's what I decided to do. And I never thought I would be any sort of judge. After all, the first uh, woman full-time judge had only been appointed 10 years earlier in 1962, so it wouldn't have been a very realistic ambition. But I had to get my academic show on the road. And one thing led to another. I, I, my very first book was on mental health law. And that led to my very first judicial post as a chair of mental health review tribunals, deciding whether people should remain detained in psychiatric hospitals. I helped to start a new learner journal on social welfare law. And that led to my being appointed to the Council on Tribunals, which was a quango that used to supervise all the myriad of uh, specialist tribunals set up mainly to administer the welfare state. And I think it also led to a tap on the shoulder to become an assistant recorder, a part-time judge in Crown and County Courts. I was invited down to London to see uh, the civil servant in charge of judicial appointments in the Lord Chancellor's department. And he explained that they wanted to diversify uh, the, uh, the bench, not by appointing more women or more people of color, but by appointing a few academics who had practitioner experience. And at the end of the interview, he said to me, well, Brenda, having met you and talked it over with you, is there something you'd rather do? So I thought I'd failed the interview. Uh, but in fact, of course, I said yes, I was going to do it. Um, and uh, again, if I hadn't said yes, I wouldn't have uh, had the career that I've had. So there we go. Uh, then I wrote a big book on family law, and that, I think, led to my becoming a law commissioner, a statutory body which promotes the reform of the law. And I spent nine and a half happy years there. I never thought that my biggest project, the Children Act, would become the title of a novel by Ian McEwan and a film starring Emma Thompson. Uh, the um, Court of Appeal judge who advised Ian McEwan uh, about family law to help him write the book uh, always used to say that she made a much more convincing family division judge than he, he ever had, which I think is true. There we go. I won't tell you who it was. Anyway. Uh, Nine and a half years on the Law Commission uh, led to the High Court bench in January 1994. And McEwen gives a reasonable picture uh, of life as a family division judge, although the life and death decisions he describes are comparatively rare. Most of the work is taking children away from their families, in practice their mothers, sending runaway mothers back to Australia or wherever else they have run away from with their children but without permission, trying to get children to see their fathers, trying to protect women and children from violent and abusive men, and trying to get fathers to provide properly for their families. That's mostly what it is. So it's mostly oppressing women, really. Um, uh, but somebody's got to do it. Um, and it is extremely uh, interesting work because every family is different and every problem is different. The law isn't particularly difficult, but the, but the uh, problems are. The standout example of a case when, when I was in the family division uh, was deciding um, where somebody 
should be buried. This was an Australian Aboriginal young man who'd been adopted as a young child uh, in Australia by an English family uh, and brought up here. And he was killed in a road accident. But by a chapter of uh, strange events, uh, he had uh, been in contact with his Australian family uh, and they wanted his body returned to Australia so that uh, his bones could be scattered in the ancestral homelands. Whereas his English family wanted him buried here next to his adoptive father who'd already died so that there would be a grave for his young daughter uh, and his partner uh, to visit. That was what the dispute was. There's no law to tell you how to decide a dispute like that. What do you do? Um, well, how many of you would have sent him to Australia? And how many of you would have kept him here? That's the usual division. <laughs> Um, I've, of course, I've not told you the whole of the facts of the case. It was a, there were lots of uh, quite interesting, complicated facts about the case. Um, I decided that I had to look at the interests of the Australian family, the English family, and above all, of his young daughter. And if I looked at all of those interests, the interests of the young daughter in having a grave to visit when she had lost her father so very young uh, seemed to me to tip the balance in favor of uh, uh, remaining here. Uh, but the Australian family was very much against uh, cremation. And so the English family agreed that they would not have the body cremated and it would be properly buried. So there was a degree of compromise went on and that there would be proper rituals for the Australian family to perform beforehand. So I hope it all worked out. All right. Anyway, that was an absolutely fascinating case. Absolutely nothing like it probably ever before or ever again. Anyway, after five years in the High Court, I was promoted to the Court of Appeal. Um, sitting in the civil division, hearing all sorts of cases, uh, family, property, contract, commercial, public law claims, um, not crime because there's a separate division dealing with crime. And the standout examples of cases in the um, Court of Appeal concerned women who never meant to have a child but became pregnant as a result of medical negligence. The House of Lords had already decided that they couldn't get the cost of bringing up a healthy baby because a healthy child is a blessing and a delight. So, you know, obviously it's quite wrong to compensate you for having to bring the child up, even though on normal principles that would be the law. But we had a case which involved the extra cost if the child was disabled. Could you get that? And we in the Court of Appeal decided that you could. And the hospital didn't appeal. But what if the mother's disabled? In fact, this particular mother was blind. And so it's obviously going to cost her more to bring up the child that she never meant to have. So could she get the extra costs of bringing up a healthy child? Well, in the Court of Appeal, we held that she could. Went off to the House of Lords, and the House of Lords were divided. Four of them said, yes, she, no, four of them, three of them said, yes, she could. And four of them said, no, it's wrong to give you damages for bringing up a healthy child. But we recognize that this is a gross invasion of this woman's autonomy and right to live her life the way she wanted to do. So she could have a not nominal sum to compensate her for that, 15,000 pounds. Hmm. Well, that was a totally new remedy that they invented. Uh, I was quite glad um, because I had said an awful lot in my judgment in the first case about what having a child means to a woman. Uh, and that what it brings with it is not so much financial cost, but caring responsibility. 24-7, until the child is old enough to look after themselves, which may be when they're 40, <laughs> if you're lucky. Um, 
you know, that's, that's the responsibility that her, that her mother um, shoulders when she has a child that she never meant to have. And I did go to town on it. And I think that must have had some effect on the, uh, their lordships, because at least they decided that this woman should have something. So there we go. So shortly after that, I was promoted to the House of Lords. Uh, and that was then the top court for the whole of the United Kingdom, not just England and Wales presided over by the Lord Chancellor, head of judiciary, but also a senior member of the government and speaker of the House of Lords, although in practice he hardly ever sat as a judge. The judges were life peers called Lords of Appeal in ordinary, because they were paid, uh, set up by statute in 1876. Um, they only heard cases raising arguable, i.e. difficult, points of law of general public importance. So all the cases were interesting and very varied. And I think probably the standout examples of cases which came my way in the House of Lords were three cases challenging the Hunting Act 2004. Now you know that that was the most controversial piece of legislation in the whole of the Blair years. Uh, took up more time than anything else. And we were asked firstly, was it a valid act of parliament at all? Well, we held that it was. Uh, secondly, was it compatible with the Human Rights Act? We held that it was. Uh, and thirdly, was it compatible with European Union law? We held that it was, but it was all great good fun. <laughs> but by the time that I joined the House of Lords, it was already clear that the position of the Lord Chancellor was untenable, and the presence of the highest court in the Upper House of Parliament was wrong in principle. Parliaments passed laws. Judges apply and interpret them and also develop the common law. So the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 created the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. But we had to wait until 2009 for them to find a suitable building, decant its reluctant occupants, refurbish it for us. And then the law lords became justices of the Supreme Court. But those of us who were in the House of Lords could return once we retired from judging. So theoretically, I could go and operate as a parliamentarian, but I haven't yet got round to doing so. Far too busy doing things like this. <laughs> now, it took them until 2004 to appoint the first woman law lord. And sadly, they didn't manage to appoint another one while we were still in the House of Lords. So I am the only lady law lord ever. Now, it's a source of pride to have been one, but it's not a sort of source of satisfaction that I was the only one. There is a special place in hell, as Madeleine Albright said, for women who don't help other women. So I wondered what I was doing wrong. It took them until 2017 to appoint a second woman justice. And I was different from my 11 brethren in several ways, not just my gender. I went to a state day school, not an independent boys boarding school, which almost all of the others did. I went for a short time to the provincial bar, not the smart London bar. I practiced in poor folks law, not posh folks law, i.e. commercial and property law. I made my professional reputation as an academic and public servant, not as a top barrister. And it gradually dawned on me, another difference was that I was employed, not self-employed, for all my professional life. So there you are, lots of differences between them and me. And at least one of them found me a bit of a challenge. I can't resist quoting from the diary of Lord Hope, uh, one of the Scottish law lords. Uh, his entry for the 31st of December, 2003, just before I joined the Lords, said, a new team of Brenda Hale, Bob Carswell, and Simon Brown will inject a different atmosphere into the corridor. Of the three, Simon will keep up the spirit of good humor. Bob will drop neatly into Brian Hutton's shoes as our man from Northern Ireland. And Brenda will be a source of some anxiety. <laughs> until we adjust to the very different contribution she will make. Well, I'm not sure he ever did adjust, actually. <laughs> there we go. So, we became the Supreme Court. What is the Supreme Court for? 
Well, unlike Supreme Courts in most other countries in the Anglo-American legal world, which have written constitutions, the UK Supreme Court cannot strike down acts of the UK Parliament as unconstitutional. The guiding principle of our constitution is that Parliament is sovereign. It means that Parliament can make or unmake any law. For a while, Parliament gave the courts power to ignore provisions in Acts of Parliament which were inconsistent with binding EU law. But what Parliament has given, Parliament can take away. So when the Uni European Communities Act uh, 1972 was repealed, the power to ignore provisions in UK Acts of Parliament was taken away. Now our relationship with the European Convention on Human Rights is quite different. The Human Rights Act 1998 requires everyone to try and interpret acts of the UK Parliament consistently with the rights set out in the Convention. But if we can't do that, the most any court can do is make a declaration that it is incompatible. This leaves it and anything done under it intact, but tells the government and parliament that we think the UK will lose if the claimant complains to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And to its credit, the government and parliament have acted to correct all the declarations of incompatibility that have been made to date, apart perhaps from one. Uh, the one about prisoners voting. They were very reluctant to do anything about, and eventually all they did was make some administrative changes which the Council of Europe reluctantly agreed were sufficient. But why do we have a Supreme Court at all? Isn't one tier of appeal enough? Well, there are three reasons, which seem good to me. First, its decisions ought to be better than those of the courts below. It hears far fewer cases. It has more help from the lawyers who conduct them and from its own judicial assistance. It can take time to think things through in principle. It's not bound by the decisions in the courts below, as they are. It is not even bound by previous decisions of the House of Lords or Supreme Court, although it doesn't often depart from them. It sits in panels of five, seven, nine, or on two memorable recent occasions, 11. The theory is that the more heads are thinking about a problem, the more robust the answer will be. Second, there has to be a top court for the whole United Kingdom. There are separate justice systems in England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. But there's a lot of law which is common to the whole United Kingdom. This is mostly statute law, tax, social security, immigration and asylum, Laws based on international treaties, including human rights law, employment and equality law. But there are also areas of judge-made law, which everyone agrees ought to be the same throughout the United Kingdom. The best example is the law of negligence, which is derived from the famous Scottish case of Donoghue and Stevenson about the alleged snail in the ginger beer bottle. So we need a top court, which can resolve differences of opinion between the courts in England, Scotland or Northern Ireland. And we also need a top court whose decisions on an issue of UK law will be binding on courts throughout the United Kingdom. And then thirdly, we need a constitutional court for the whole United Kingdom. This has been so ever since the Government of Ireland Act set up separate parliaments for the North and South of Ireland in 1920 and gave them defined but limited powers to pass their own legislation. It's been even more so since 1998, when parliaments were set up in Scotland and Wales with defined powers to make laws for their own countries. So the Supreme Court has to decide whether those laws are within the powers which the UK Parliament has given them. So this means that we can strike down acts of the parliaments of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, which are not law because they're outside their powers. There's even a procedure for the law officers to refer bills passed by the parliaments before royal assent uh, and other devolution issues direct to the court to see whether the default institutions have acted within their powers. And the most recent example, which you'll all have heard about, was the reference by the Lord Advocate, the Scottish equivalent of our Attorney General, of the proposed Scottish independence referendum bill to the Supreme Court which rather unsurprisingly the Supreme Court decided was not within their powers. 
But there are other constitutional cases defining the relationship between the three organs of government, parliament, the government, and the judiciary. One example was the first Hunting Act case, where it was alleged that the act was not a true act of parliament because it was passed without the assent of the House of Lords. So there we go. But the most famous cases recently have been about the relationship between our government and our parliament. The first case brought by Mrs. Miller was about whether the government could give notice to leave the European Union without the approval of parliament. Treaty making is one of the prerogative powers of the crown now exercised by the government. So the government can make or unmake any treaty, but the government cannot change the law unless Parliament has given it power to do so. Making or unmaking a treaty doesn't normally change the law. This is long established constitutional law. But leaving the European Union would automatically change the law. So it's alarming to say the least to see the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, the Master of the Rolls, and a senior Court of Appeal judge being labelled enemies of the people by a certain newspaper, simply for reaffirming the well-established principle that the government could not, without parliamentary approval, change the law. And this, of course, was upheld in the Supreme Court. The second case brought by Mrs Miller was about whether the Prime Minister could lawfully advise the Queen to suspend the operation of Parliament for five weeks out of the eight remaining before the UK would automatically drop out of the European Union unless the deadline were extended. The High Court of England and Wales, in the case brought by Mrs Miller, held that this was a political question with which the court should not get involved. The Court of Session in Scotland, on the other hand, in the case brought by Ms. Joanna Cherry, QC as she then was MP, and 70 odd other parliamentarians held that the advice given to the Queen was unlawful, void, and of no effect. So that Parliament had not, in fact, been prorogued. Well, they couldn't both be right. There's only one UK Parliament, it either had or had not been prorogued. So the Supreme Court had to decide the case. And we also had to do so quickly. Otherwise, there would have been no point uh, if the Scots happened to be right. And of course, we decided that the Scots were right, although not for exactly the same reasons. And Parliament resumed the next day. What we were not deciding in either case was whether Brexit should happen. That had already been decided by the government, which had agreed to abide by the will of the people expressed in the referendum, even though it was not legally binding. Now, it's an important illustration that judges in the United Kingdom are not appointed for political reasons. This was true even when the Lord Chancellor was responsible for judicial appointments. My first two judicial appointments as an assistant recorder and then as a High Court judge were under Conservative Lord Chancellors, Lord Hailsham and Lord Mackay. My next two to the Court of Appeal and the House of Lords were under Labour Lord Chancellors, Lord Irvin and Lord Faulkner, which I think tells you that it's not political. The last two were under the new system of independent merit-based selection introduced by the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005. That was as Deputy President and then as President of the Supreme Court. And I can honestly say that I didn't know the politics, if any, of almost all my colleagues on either the House of Lords or the Supreme Court. There were two I could make a jolly good guess about. Uh, one, because he had been Solicitor General for Scotland in a Conservative administration, and the other because long ago he had written a book denouncing the concept of equality uh, with uh, a certain uh, leading Conservative uh, politician. Now, the new system has replaced the old tap on the shoulder after secret soundings method of appointment. It's definitely led to a much better gender balance on the bench at all levels, except sadly now the Supreme Court. We got up to three women out of 12 in the Supreme Court, and then all three of us retired, and they've only managed to appoint one woman 
to fill the vacancy. So there are now more men called David who went to Cambridge sitting on the Supreme Court than there are women, which seems rather sad. And of course, we have not made anything like as much progress with ethnic diversity, and particularly the proportion of black judges, which is lamentably low and has not been going up at all. And the lack of diversity, just to finish off, matters for at least four reasons. The first is the legitimacy of the administration of justice in a democracy. The rule of law means that everyone should have access to and trust in the justice system. The court should be seen as the people's courts, with justice administered for everyone, and not just by some alien beings laying down the law for the common people. And a second one is that the values of the law are justice, fairness, and equality. Getting the right result, doing it in the right way, and treating everyone equally. And the courts should embody those values. And they don't if they have no women, people of color, disabled people, or other people from minority groups. And that includes people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. The third reason is equality of opportunity. There are so many bright young women and people of color going into the law for a long time now, but they haven't been getting to the top in the same numbers. It's wasting their talents by not recognizing them, wasting for them and wasting for us. And it is worrying that the success rates for applicants from ethnic minorities for judicial posts are lower than others. So there's work to be done. And then, of course, the final reason is, well, perhaps we make a difference. We all bring our experience of life to the business of judging. Women and people of color have different experiences of life from white men. People from state schools have different experiences from people from independent schools, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we all have something to bring to the business of deciding cases, perhaps particularly in the higher courts where law is made. There's not much point in having more judges, even 11 judges, decide important cases if they all think alike and have similar experiences of life. So the bottom line is that diverse bodies make better decisions. And I think diversity is important in any nation, such as the nation of Israel, just as it's important here and in the judiciary. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I will now take questions and I will ask Tal to be the roving uh, microphone holder. So anyone has any questions, please put your hand up. I can see Mohammed straight away. Baris Hale, given your experience on the UK Supreme Court, and you must have detailed knowledge of many other countries, do you think the UK should follow most of the world by having a codified constitution? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I'm always asked that question. Um, and it's a very good question, of course. Um, and the first answer to it is that it will never happen. And the reason that it will never happen is twofold. The first is that in any codified constitution, the constitution is the higher law, and therefore ordinary laws cannot change it, and there has to be a court which decides whether they do change it. In other words, there has to be a court which strikes down acts of the UK Parliament. That's the first reason. The UK Parliament is not going to like a court having the power to strike down their, their acts. And indeed, I don't think the English courts or the Scottish courts or the Welsh courts or the Irish courts want it. 
Um, we're rather happy the way things are. Uh, and of course, the other thing about a written constitution is that it has to be entrenched in the sense that it has to be hard to change the constitution. Uh, the US Constitution is particularly hard to change. Uh, most of them are not as difficult as that, but they all do have provisions in them that can only be changed either by a supermajority in both houses of parliament or by a referendum or both. So those are the two reasons why it will never happen, because I can't see our parliament ever voting for it. There is another problem, but it's not universal, uh, which is that... If there has to be a court which can strike down acts of the elected parliament, well then the politicians tend to want to have a bigger say in the appointment of the judges who sit on that court. And they tend to want to try and rule from the grave by appointing people, shall we just say, to take an obvious example, Republican presidents of the United States of America, have appointed judges who are known to be Republicans and known to think the way they want them to think at a young age, and they're appointed for life. And so they're going to rule over the democratic decisions of Congress or the state parliaments um, in certain important respects. Uh, so it is in some quite deep way anti-democratic although it is also supposed to be a way of protecting the rights of minorities against the <laughs> tyranny of the majority. So, there are, I mean, there are difficult arguments both ways. That particular problem is not encountered uh, with anything like the same force in almost every other country which has a written constitution. They seem to manage to get by okay. Um, we should be looking to Canada uh, rather than to the United States for the model of how to do these things. But because of the model of the United States. That's another reason why it's not gonna happen, I'm afraid. A question, question. I will take, I'm going to, I'm going to go around this way. Would I, can I take your question first, sir? Yes. Microphone. Yeah. You know, in your references to Israel, you make little hints about diversity and so on. But just let's suppose that you're invited to abuse the declaration as a gentleman did many, many years ago. What would be the Lady Hill recommendation declaration to Israel? Oh, well, that's. Yes. What would, what would be the Lady Hale declaration to Israel? The Lady Hale version of the Balfour Declaration, I think, is what you're asking for. Uh, and you also very kindly uh, did, did say that I had been very tactful about Israel. Well, I think it's right to be tactful about a um, country, which, as I said, I hugely respect. Um, and of course, I respect the right of the state of Israel to exist. And I understand why, constitutionally, it calls itself a Jewish state. But it also has a substantial number of uh, inhabitants who are citizens of Israel who are not Jewish. Not only that, of course, it has occupied um, large parts uh, of the territory of Palestine looking at Palestine as the totality, uh, where the inhabitants are not treated uh, as equal participants in society. Um, one only has to, to go to the occupied territories to, find, to see how, how they are treated. Uh, and so one has got, um, and one's also got the problem of Jerusalem. So you've got three different groups of non-Jewish people who are basically under the control of the Israeli state, one way or another, who are not treated as equal partners or people or citizens, whatever you like to call it. Um, and so I think the Lady Hale Declaration would be the same as the Balfour Declaration. It would have the two parts to it. Mm. Yes. And, uh it's interesting as well, leading on from that, that if one could go back to the village itself, 
the village itself is governed by uh, a governing body which is comprised equal numbers from both communities, so to speak. So that there is almost a microcosm of what probably should happen in the wider state. John, you're going to contradict me. No, no. <laughs> no I want to ask you a question. Um, I'm, going to take I'm your... sure John can shout. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm just um, wondering what you think is going wrong with the appointment of the uh, judiciary, because there's plenty of declarations about uh, diversity, but something is clearly not happening that should happen. I don't know what I thought it was. Well, I think it's not... As far as gender is concerned, it's done pretty well in the course, the course of this century. This is a very alarming uh, thing. Um, because we've now got up to something like over 40% overall women in the judiciary and something like 30% in the High Court and Court of Appeal. The Supreme Court is you know, a bit of a separate problem, really. Um, so we are doing pretty well for women, I think, and that's a huge change from uh, two decades ago. We're not doing so well for ethnic minorities. Mm. There has been an increase, but it's still below the proportion that it should be uh, if you look at the um, available pool. But the increase has all been in people of Asian heritage, not people of black heritage. Uh, and given the over-representation of black people in the criminal justice system as defendants, it really is pretty vital that we try and have more black judges. And there are plenty of black lawyers. You know. So there is a worry that even those who apply, a lot of them don't want to be judges, of course, and who can blame anybody for not wanting to be a judge? Um, it, but... Uh, it, there is a worry that the failure rate of those who do apply from ethnic minorities is greater than the failure rate of other groups. And that is a worry uh, because one suspects that there are various hidden forces at work there. It won't be racism as such, but it will be all sorts of little things that happen in the course of any um, uh, appointments process. Uh, which means that people don't somehow fit, fit the bill. Uh, and, and clearly that's got to be addressed. Somebody has got to think of ways of addressing that. We still have huge assumptions about who gets what sort of judging job, don't we? I mean, you know as well as I do. No. The assumption is that the top QCs become high court judges. Um, the uh, successful but not quite as successful barristers uh, and, if, and some solicitors become circuit judges. Solicitors become district judges, both in the county courts and in the district courts. And anybody can be a tribunal judge. And diversity in the tribunal judiciary is excellent, uh, which tells you something, doesn't it? And so I think that those stereotypes you know, do take a lot of, of cracking down. Uh, I think the JAC is aware of the problem, um, but there's also a question of consultation uh, and whether consultation produces more of the same. Uh, it's called privilege hoarding. That's quite a nice phrase, isn't it? Um, but we know what we mean. Um, so there's quite, a lot of, there's quite a lot of thought going into this, but the, the important th thing is to recognize that there's a problem and then you can start looking for what the causes are and how to solve it. And it's only this century that really it's been recognized that there's a problem. So that's progress. I'm an eternal optimist, as you may have noticed. There was a lady on the front row, a second row, who has her hand up. I'm inspired by the clarity with which you express yourself. Um, I wondered if you might have some advice for a barrister in training as to what makes for successful appellate advocacy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a personal question. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you number one, and you've got it, be audible. <laughs> I am staggered by the number of experienced advocates 
who have difficulty making themselves heard. Yeah. So, and if you can't be heard, you can't persuade. Um, appellate advocacy is, is pretty different from um, trial advocacy. Trial advocacy, the most important thing is to be able to get the right things out of the witnesses. And then to be able to, if you're doing a crime, of course, address a jury or make submission, persuade a judge. Uh, but it's getting the facts straight, or at least getting the story out in the way you want it out. That's quite a skill. Whereas, of course, appellate advocacy is arguing the law. Well, you've probably done lots of that. Um, I, think, uh, I think the second thing that I would say, apart from be heard, is be crisp. Um, some people seem to think the way to win in the law is to make things as difficult as possible and as complicated as possible. Uh, and that's a particular trait uh, with lawyers who are handling cases which involve large sums of money. <laughs> and I don't know why that's the case. Because the very best advocates uh, at appellate level, certainly in the Supreme Court, are those who can make things sound absolutely crystal clear and simple. I can remember a certain KC, who's an extremely good advocate, at getting up and beginning this case, which was about company law, saying, this case bristles with simplicity. <laughs> so I started my judgment saying, as counsel said, this case bristles with simplicity, and indeed it did. You know, strip it back to the bare bones of the argument. Uh, of course, the other advice I'd give is, go along when certain stars are performing or tune in to the Supreme Court when certain stars are performing and watch what they do. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the gentleman on the back row who's had his hand up, yes, a long time. Thank you very much. Uh, Baroness Hale, could you give us a glimpse behind the scenes what happens when a panel of Supreme Court justices retires to consider their verdict? And could you say whether you have been swayed by the opinions of your fellow justices or whether you have very often swayed them? <laughs> well, um, what happens in the Supreme Court is what uh, used to happen in the House of Lords and it's a practice that derives from the Privy Council. And that is, after the hearing, um, well, it used to be in the House of Lords, everybody used to get out of the room. And we used to have our meeting in the same committee room. But in the Supreme Court, we get out of the room and go to a separate meeting room. And we go around the table, starting with the most junior justice. And everybody is expected to say what their provisional view is of the result of the case and brief reasons why. Uh, and so we do that, we go around the table. By the time it gets to the presider, it's pretty clear what the likely outcome of the case will be. And therefore, it's for the presider to allocate the writing of the lead judgment, what I call the donkey work judgment, the judgment that sets out you know, the issue, the facts, what we know about the law to date, and what we think the law should be and how we apply it to the facts. That's, that's the donkey work judgment. Uh, and you pick the person, well, there's a certain amount of trying to allocate work fairly, uh, of course, and not overburden some people and underburden others. Uh, but you try and pick the person whose uh, brief account most nearly represents what would command a majority in the court. Um, and then, of course, that person goes away and writes a judgment, uh, and people are free to dissent from it. They're also free to add concurrences, um, hopefully only if they've got something to add as opposed to writing. In the House of Lords, one used to get, in the olden days, four or five judgments reaching the same result for slightly different reasons. The lawyers loved it, but nobody else did. Now, the lawyers loved it because it gave them wriggle room for the next case, um, but no, it's not obviously the right way to go. So we have always tried to have a single lead judgment and a clear uh, decision and reasoning in the case uh, to which a majority 
suppliers. And, and that's been a definite um, policy in the Supreme Court, which has largely been successful. Of course, you change your mind in the course of discussion, or you may do, or you change your mind when you see it written down, or you change your mind when you try and write yourself. This is certainly the case you know, when you're a trial judge. You know, you might think you're going to reach a certain conclusion, and then you settle down and write it, and it doesn't write. It doesn't make sense, it doesn't, doesn't add up, and so you can change your mind. So it's, it, it is certainly possible um, for minds to be changed. Uh, and they can be changed during the course of the hearing as well. I was asked very recently by a, um, one of the top advocates whether oral advocacy made a difference. And uh, I said, well, I hope it doesn't. Um, you know, one, one would like the case to win rather than the advocate to win. Uh, but the oral hearing makes a difference because the, the the interchange of views that happen when you're sitting round a metaphorical table with counsel and your colleagues certainly make a difference. And the debate in the meeting can make a difference. Definitely it can make a difference. It certainly make a difference to the reasoning and the detail, not so much usually to the, the actual outcome. Um, and I'm sure I have been swayed by people in the course of the meeting and I may have persuaded a few people. Because after all, we don't get a lot of dissent. We do get some dissent. It's an important safety valve, um, but we don't get a huge amount. About 80% of judgments are unanimously for one result. I will take, I'm afraid, one last question. Yes, of course. Yes, 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 you. <laughs> Well, I have a question to ask you. Um, what are your views on abortion autonomy? Um, since the overturned case of Roe and Wade happened in America, um, do you think there should be one view to start in the case? There should be what? Um, that abortion cases, abortion should be uh, restricted banned. You're joking. <laughs> Yes, but it hasn't banned abortion. Yeah, not completely, but maybe some states have started. So what, are yes, right. what, what, what the Dobbs case does is say that there is no constitutional right to an abortion, and therefore it is a matter for the legislature of each of the states of the United States of America. That's what that case decides. Now, we have an abortion act in the UK. Actually, no, not in the UK, in, in Great Britain. Uh, dating back to 1967. It's, it's had some amendments to it, but basically that's the, that's the foundation of our law. Um, and I'm not aware of any great move to change it. Um, and, uh, and that's partly because, unlike the law in the United States, this was law that was enacted by Parliament. Mm. And one of the problems with Roe and Wade was that it was not enacted by any of the parliaments. Um, and that is one of the points made by the majority in the, in the Dobbs case, that, uh, that uh, Roe and Wade looked as if it was um, legislating for something, uh, which in their view shouldn't be done. Now, I, I, I was on a panel talking about really constitutional matters uh, with... Uh, my uh, esteemed colleague, um, Lord Sumption, was asked his opinion about these cases, and he said, in his view, Roe and Wade was a bad decision, and Dobbs was even worse. <laughs> and you get the point. Uh, so I don't disagree, I very rarely disagree with my brother Sumption, but I don't disagree with him on that particular. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brenda. I'm now going to ask John Bowers if he will uh, say a few words. Well, after such a wonderful address, um, we can all see that Lord Hope was completely wrong to be anxious about uh, uh, Brenda joining the court. You've been 
a terrifically um, humane and rigorous judge, although every time I've appeared before you, you've found against me. Uh, <laughs> but rightly, rightly, of course. Uh, I emphasize I'm not on a commission, but I would recommend uh, Spider Woman, um, Lady Hale's uh, wonderful book. I'll just read you a um, short extract which perhaps uh, sums it up. She says this, this is a story how, of how that little girl from a little school in a little village in North Yorkshire became the most senior judge in the United Kingdom, how she found that she could cope, and how all those other people who feel they are imposters mm -hmm. can learn to cope too. Some of them may even be men. <laughs> It's an absolutely wonderful book, and thank you for a really wonderful uh, address to us uh, tonight. How proud Philip Rueff would have been of tonight. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lawrence Brass, and I'm the vice chairman of the charity Oasis of Peace UK. Our chairman, Sir Andrew Burns, the former British ambassador to Israel, is this week in Sweden, where he's uh, holding an international seminar on Holocaust studies. He can't be with us. He's asked me to convey his apologies. But I think he's watching on Zoom. So hello, Andrew. I hope it's not too cold in Stockholm for you. And uh, I, I'm sure that uh, he would have been as delighted as I am to have heard such a wonderful speech. Brenda, thank you so much. My friends, I've been asked to say a few words tonight uh, about the inspirational primary school at Never Shalom, Wahat al Salam, which, apart from the wonderful speech of Lady Hale, brought us here tonight, and to explain why I hope you'll support it. But the truth is, I've been made redundant by the brilliant video which you saw at the outset of the evening. And I want to tell you that that video wasn't some slick PR advertising spiel. It was a film taken by our wonderful new executive director, Tal. Stand up, Tal, take a bow. That was a wonderful film. She took it in the village with her own camera. And I know because I was there watching her do it in the village a few days ago. And the kids weren't primed about what to say. It was really genuinely spontaneous. And I hope you felt as I did that some of their views were very, very moving. I think the children encapsulated everything I wanted to tell you about the school in the village. And I was particularly struck by the words of young Natan, who said, and I quote, Israel and Palestinians are supposed to be enemies, not to like each other. So they made this school because they wanted Jews and Arabs to be together. Well, that really sums it all up. Then are the words of, of Muhammad, who said, and I quote again his exact words from the video, I love it that there are both Jews and Arabs at this school. People ask me, how is it for us to be together? And I tell them, we are all friends. We enjoy playing football together. Everybody learns together and plays together. Everybody has friends. No one is alone. That's what this school is about. And again, what lovely moving words. There's nothing much I can add to those words and the cameos that Tal so ably recorded. One of the little girls shown on the film confirmed we learn Hebrew, English, and Arabic, she said. But I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the problem is that the government in Israel aren't able to pay for the extra teaching staff that a unique school like our primary school in the village uh, demands. So we, the British friends, pay for those extra teachers that are needed, and we also pay for the 
special books, and I've seen them, and we've got the Schusters here, we'll tell you, in the school, every book is half of it on the left side is Hebrew, the right side is Arabic, or vice versa. Every, everything is divided. I was there last month, as I said, when the Israeli election results were announced, and David, I, I, I share your view. I can't disguise my own disquiet at the election outcome. The new coalition uh, that's riding back to power in, in Jerusalem is a rowdy alliance of ultra-nationalists whose mantra is exactly the opposite of everything that the village espouses. And I thought when I got there, I'd find them in despair at those election results, but quite the opposite. These villages are, if nothing else, resilient. And as you said, David, they had an arson attack, not once, twice. Two arson attacks in the last two years. Last year and again this year in January, when the School of Peace Library was almost destroyed. And you know what they did? They dusted themselves down and started to rebuild. And I've seen the rebuilding works. And by the way, you should know, ladies and gentlemen, that the British friends of Never Shalom are now helping uh, by donating extra security cameras, which sadly are needed uh, in order to deter any further attacks. But we won't give up, and they will carry on. So if the village can overcome two arson attacks, they certainly won't be deterred by a Knesset, which in the main personifies the very opposite ethos of what the village stands for. So, my friends, if the village and the inspiring primary school, which you saw portrayed in that video, can fight back despite all the setbacks, so must we. And I'm asking you tonight to support, if you can, please, Natan and Mohammed and the other kids who spoke so movingly in Tal's wonderful film. Let's show them that we in this country are right behind them. So please, there are cards around. Tal, would you stand up? You, you've got the cards. I think they're going to be outside or they're on your chairs. Fill them in. Give as generously as you can, please, so you were able to send those children the message and their brilliant teachers that we do understand what they're trying to do and we do want to help them achieve their objectives. David, thank you to you and your committee for the work you've done to put on tonight's wonderful evening and thank you ladies and gentlemen on behalf of the charity for your attendance and I wish you shalom and salam.